Hey folks, welcome, Rock History Music, John Bowden. This is three days in a row now, basically, going on and doing a live feed, which is uh, something we want to do a lot more of on this channel. It's just, uh, we have thousands of interviews. And there are interviews from the early days that we did that a lot of you haven't seen. You'd have to go back to our channels. I don't even know how many videos we have out now. I know we're in the thousands that we've, and we've got a hun almost 130,000 subscribers, which is, man, that feels good. That's why we have a newsletter though. Um, in the description, I'm not sure if I actually put it in. Let me just make sure because it should be in the description and it might not be here. Let me just put that in of the description of this video so that anyone who's watching the video will be able to join our mailing list. I'm just putting it in right now. It's, it's kind of neat that you can do this live. You can just put it on live. So on if you're watching this on Rock History Music, because it's also being streamed on Rock History Book, uh, you, you can join our newsletter uh, right on the bottom and, uh, you know, you get updates on... Not everyone's getting the newsletter. We're not sure why we've... Uh, uh, I don't know if we made a, a mistake from our end, but a lot of you are getting the newsletter. So if you aren't... It should be fixed by tomorrow where we'll just basically send you a title of a video and sometimes a description, but most of the time just the link. So, you know, if you're not in the in the mood to, to watch videos or look at this face, because <laughs> sometimes I'm not when I'm editing videos, um, you can you can wait till later or else uh, watch them anytime. So anyway, thanks for everyone who's on. Let me make sure... I'm going to say here we are, because sometimes that here we are. There we go. Because I know we're getting we're getting people talking to us for whatever reason. Sometimes, let me see, let me see, let me see. Just give me a second and uh, here we go. Yeah, we're already getting some, but it's not showing up on our feed here for whatever reason. Justiny, hey, John, Justiny, what are you doing on, what, why are you doing? Oh, no. uh, Lou Graham, uh, did you not see the title? It's right there. The fact that Midnight Blue, Lou Graham's biggest hit, was rejected by Mick Jones of Foreigner, and it should it was meant to be a Foreigner song. It would have been a big Foreigner hit, if not one of their biggest hits, because there's just something about that snappiness of that song um, and where it was. What a rocking song, William says, a Midnight Blue. I'm not sure. I wonder why it's not showing up here. That's kind of funny. Anyway. I bought this um, stream deck. Here it is. I bought this stream deck quite a few months ago, thanks to your donations. It's basically because of the donations we received. There's always a PayPal link in all our videos where some po folks sometimes just say, hey, love your channel. Don't want to buy a t-shirt. The links for that are there as well. Don't need a t-shirt. Don't need a cap. But I'd like to help out the channel. And we'll get to Lou Graham in a second. And that's why it's there. And a lot of folks basically help out and they want to help out. And so anyway, we had a lot of technical problems yesterday. Man, first, the, the first night on Friday night we came on, we were talking about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Lou Graham. And it turned out really, really good. It was great. But my daughter was screaming at the top of her lungs, her 25-year-old autistic daughter, because she's on medication that's making her very cranky. And... Uh, even my wife said, are you sure you want to go on tonight? Because this is crazy pants tonight. It's kind of kooky. Um, she's doing much better. Yesterday I came on without this. And my mic was not muted when I was playing clips. Everything should go good today. Famous last words. I don't know why our... Uh, it's so weird that our uh, our chat's not coming up on... on uh, hold on. Text messages, top messages, top messages, all messages. <laughs> I don't know why. But we're getting the messages here, which is good. Absolutely agree. The fact that the band passed on the song, which would have been a surefire hit for them for sure. Well, it was. It was a big a top 10 hit. Um, the title track from Ready or Not is awesome. Not a bad track on that album. Thank you for everyone who's, who's uh, commenting. Uh, I have an iPad here and it's not showing up, but everything, I've double checked everything. From now on, when I put a clip up, 
Sorry about that yesterday. Uh, boing. When I put a clip up, it'll mute my microphone. And yesterday I had a, a frog in my throat and I, I kept clearing my mouth while Lou Graham was talking. That's a big no-no. You know, I try, I, I try to let the artist talk whenever I interview someone. But sometimes it's very conversational. It's a little harder. That's one thing. Coughing while the interview is playing, that's a whole other thing. So what we're going to play the first clip is about the title of what we're talking about, which is Midnight Blue and how it was passed up. Let me just see if there's any comments, any more comments. By the way, I hope you're having a good Easter long weekend. Lou Graham, Midnight Blue. That is a great record, by the way. Midnight Blue is my, of all the Foreigner songs and your solo songs, Midnight Blue of all those songs is my favorite song. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and I wrote that in the same basement with, with me playing guitar and, and my fingers are fat. And a lot of times I'd hit two strings instead of one when I'm fingering it. Uh, but as soon, but then I went on piano and I played the right chords that are supposed to be there and, and wrote 90%, eight, well, about 75% of the song and, and called in my friend, Bruce Turgan, who was in Black Sheep with me. And at that time, Bruce was now in four. I got Bruce in Foreigner. Right. And, and um, so he came in, heard what I was struggling with uh, on my lame guitar playing and, and my very crude piano playing and picked up a guitar and played the chords like they're supposed to be played with attitude. So he, he played that guitar on, on the song. You know, my following days are over. Now I just got to follow through is one, one of the greatest lines of all time for me. I love that line. That That's, again, one of those lines that made me stop and go, what? What did he just say? So, 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 so get this. We were writing that song. And, and when I knew that there was going to be another Foreigner album coming up. So when Mick finally got back from his ocean tour, whatever it was, uh, Bruce and I took Midnight Blue and Heartache, the song Heartache, mm -hmm. over to him and proposed that those two songs be on the next Foreigner album. Now, they were done. There was no room for, for Mick on there. You know, they were done. It basically was Bruce and myself. And, and he heard the rough the rough tape of, of Midnight Blue. And, and he had a funny look on his face, you know? And he picked up his guitar and tried to play those chords. They're very strange fingering on, on that. And Mick is the master of that. I watched him try and duplicate those chords for 20 minutes and finally just take his guitar and put it down. And, and, and he says, then he said, it's all right, but I don't think it's for us. It's one of my all-time favorite songs, man. I, I mean, it would not take a genius to pick up on what that song had and say, even if I can't play guitar, I'll learn the right chords. That's a foreigner song. Let's play it. Yeah. But but he he turned it down, and I, and I think. I think he knew it was a good song, but because it didn't come from him, he didn't want anything to do with it. Okay? Yeah. That's the long and the short of it. That, that, that basically he was saying to me, you're fortunate that you're part of some of the big foreigner songs, but, but this song was written by you and Bruce. It had nothing to do with me. I don't want anything to do with it. And he dismissed it. So... And the song went to number five yep. in the charts and was the billboard most played rock song for that year over. I can't find what I'm looking for by you two over two or three other songs that you would think were, were awesome, awesome hits. Midnight blue topped those songs in airplay. Yeah. And, and I was so very proud of it and the whole first album. 
I love Lou Graham. I love talking to him. I love uh, listening to his stories. Remember now, uh, and it's always fair to say this, that this is Lou's point of view from all of this. And he talks about Mick Jones, who was is the leader of the band Foreigner, uh, the lead guitarist, came from a lot of different bands. I listened to him when he was in Spooky Tooth. Uh, Gary Wright was in the band for a while. And... He has proven himself many times, Mick Jones. He's, his health is bad. I'm not sure if they get inducted into the Rock and Roll of f- uh, Fame, if he'll be there because of his health problems. And we were talking uh, just the other day about um, some of the bandmates that we are we are hoping will so up, show up for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but we don't know. Al Greenwood, or Ian McDonald rather, Died in 2022, he was 75, and he was in King Crimson, was on Foreigner's first three albums, and I used to, uh, I used to call him the good-looking guy uh, in, in the band, and then we've got Al Greenwood, he's 72, he was also on the first three albums, and now we're talking about the people who can't come because they're no longer with us. Ed Gaglarity uh, died in 2014 at 62. He was on the first two Foreigner albums. Uh, a, a, a master in this band, Dennis Elliott. He is 73, played on the first seven uh, Foreigner albums. So an amazing drummer when you consider. And uh, Rick Wills. He joined uh, on Head Games. Um also, was that was in 79. He's 76 years old. He played with the Small Faces, Roxy Music, David, Peter Frampton, uh, Spooky Tooth, David Gilmore, Bad Company. And, uh, of course, on 4 Under 4. I mean, it's going a little smoother today because I've got this stream deck. Finally f- used my stream deck. After yesterday when the microphone was open and where clips were going on, I just told myself, we've we've got a... We've got to fix things up. So things from now on with our life, you're just going to go a little smoother because of me basically studying this stream deck. Because my plan was always to do a lot of things live. And when I don't have time to edit the interviews and do the intros and extras, what's what's better than doing a produced thing? Coming on live and having you comment on, on some of the stuff. Um, let me see what we got here. Hold on a second. Oops. I don't know why this is not happening. Hold on a second. Let me just get rid of this. There we go. Learning the software. Learning the software. Uh, did Lou finally retire? Seems he retired uh, at a time either, and then he came back. And that is true. He did. Um, Fraser J says, John, I didn't recognize you without the coughing. <laughs> Steve says, I liked it. When he's saying Chain of Fools, Barbara Ryan says, I love Lou Graham. The song Midnight Blue is a, 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 a fantastic song. More from our interview uh, with Lou Graham. So why, why did you come back? Why did you come back for the, uh, to, to, when in, in the last few years you came back? Uh, well, I came back after that be- because I got reports from, from friends of mine who went out and heard Foreigner with the new singer that, that it was bad. That he he was not a not a great singer live, a, and his voice didn't hold up after a couple two or three shows. He was going on stage with he was hoarse and, and couldn't hit many of the notes at all, even in in the regular part of the song. A, and and that 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 in a lot of situations, like I had a couple of friends who heard them in Las Vegas. At the end of songs, they were being booed, or the or the song would end, and there was no clapping, no cheering. It would just end, and there'd be a sick silence until they started the next song. And so, after I finished my second album and toured to support it a little bit, I was still, even though I wasn't part of the band, I was still loyal to Foreigner, and I didn't want to see what I had participated, what we had built go to hell. So, so uh, I, I um, talked to Mick and, and 
told him that that I, I had accomplished what I set out to do with my solo albums. And and that's all I wanted to do. And and uh, uh, is there a chance I could be part of Foreigner again? And uh, we, we met in, in Los Angeles during the LA riots. And we, you know, people were, con there was martial law. People were off the streets. They were confined to their homes or their hotels. And we went between his hotel room and my hotel room and talked uh, about six or seven hours a day for three or four days. And at the end of that, we had a, a reasonable understanding. I told him I wanted more input in the songwriting. I wanted to be a force in the direction of this band. You know, I've been, I've been, other than him, I've been a big part uh, of the creative process of this band. And, and I deserved to have a little more input and, and fealty in, in where the band goes. And I got that out of him. He agreed, you know. And, and so, excuse me. The next couple of years, we just toured and wrote songs. And, and uh, by then, Atlantic was going through a lot of inner turmoil. All the people that helped to make Foreigner either retired, were retired or were pushed out of their position and replaced by up and coming young, young kids, basically. You know, kids in their early 20s, mid 20s who had very little uh, uh, experience for the position they held. And their intent was to get new blood in Atlantic. And they went out signing grunge bands and yeah. uh, all sorts of different variety of, of different new music bands. And, and they literally pushed the old guard off to the side. And we asked for our release. We, we knew that as much as they helped us throughout our career, that, that they were done helping us. We were, we were dead meat to them. Mm -hmm. So we were looking around for a new label. We, we, we knew that uh, there were a couple new big labels that were starting up that, that had a slew of, of classic rock acts. And we we uh, were playing them demos of our new songs and 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 talked to them about being a part of the label. And uh, I don't know the reason, but e either we weren't enamored with them or they weren't enamored with us. Mm. And we couldn't find an established label to go on because what Atlantic was doing, they were all doing with the new, new acts, you know? So we ended up signing with an independent label on the West Coast, a guy with a lot of money and, and, and swore that his, his label was gonna, was gonna have new acts and classic rock acts and not just let the classic rock acts wallow in their, their former glories, but, but he wanted new material and, and a new lease on their professional life. And, and that sounded great, great to us. So we signed, I think it was called Rhythm Safari. They, they, they had a couple uh, uh, new acts that, that did very well for them. So we recorded- Oh, Mr. Moonlight. Mr. Moonlight. Yeah, yeah. We, we recorded most of that in Woodstock, New York. And, it, it really turned out great. The songs were fantastic. I had a, had a bigger hand in the songwriting. Uh, um, I, I was given some room in the production to, to, to influence it. it. It was, it was a, for the most part, it was a stripped down rock album, heavily influenced by, by the Beatles and, and the songs were, were were terrific 
and and the last two or three songs there was there was actually a, a ballad that I love on that album you know that I, I wish would have been a single and and there were some real heavy songs there was an instrumental on it and as it turned out rhythm safari had big dreams but what they didn't have is a promotional department Mm. kind of important yeah and and we thought they did because they bragged about that too but but when it came right down to it we, we weren't seeing records in the stores we weren't getting radio airplay unless we took the album to a station and did an interview and let them play three or four of our old songs then they would play about half of one of the new songs and fade it out thanks lou and mick for coming by and and you never heard a song from them again mm-hmm. from the new album. So so basically an album that I would put right up with not not with four or 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 maybe double vision, but it, it was a damn good album. And and it, it really I felt that it was a, one of our better albums. It 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 never saw the light of day. You know, a, a few people, by the way, I had mentioned, I asked the fans again, I got a few questions for them. And, and that album came up an awful lot. Just to, p- fans wanted to let you know that they really liked that album. They really did. And I did have it. I remember now I did have that album. Yes. It's an interesting perspective when you sign on and you're a major label. There are uh, Rich Williams of Kansas said at one point there were times with Kansas that he the band couldn't get arrested i mean it was just not a good situation and every classic rock band to some degree have gone through some of that stuff until they go full circle and then the classic rock circuit started becoming uh, like the gold axe you could you could tour fairly well either in casinos or soft seaters or whatever and make a living and and all of a sudden the you know the the, the demo was aging along with their bands and they were realizing the, 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 the clock was ticking. I always say this and I always look up here. You've heard me say this to a lot of artists. If you know this channel at all, you're watching the clock. You know, you're, it's ticking. The old you can't cheat the hangman thing. Uh, Justin, thanks for your super chat. We appreciate it. It's been a really tough month for us this month on on um, on YouTube and we're not sure why. And, and, and I say this because so many people are quitting on YouTube and it, it's occurred to us if I wouldn't be 30 interviews behind, cause I owe these people that I've talked to, I owe uh, them, well, the courtesy of putting up these interviews and, and we are literally 30 interviews behind right now. We're almost always 30 interviews behind. Shannon is learning to edit videos. Our son used to edit a lot, but he's got his band going. Uh, Karma Charm, they're called, and he also works at Costco, and he's you know starting his life. He's twenty. So anyway, thank you for the folks who do uh, either uh, give us a donation on PayPal. There's a link in the description, uh, and or just a super chat on here because it's been a really it's been the toughest month, and we've had some of the greatest interviews we've ever had on our channel, and we're going, what's going on? Like, why? This is why people are quitting YouTube because we're I'm, I'm working just as hard or harder than I've ever worked. And this is happening. Uh, we've got a few more clips from from Lou. He's an interesting chap. We talk about his well, his beginnings in, in this in these last three, four clips and a lot more. By the way, you, you have uh, you have this little word that you're very familiar with that considering your work ethic. I always call that good old fashioned grit and not a lot of people have grit. That's why second album sometimes, you know, people, you you spend your whole life doing your first album and your second album, you have like a six months or something like that. But about your work ethic, did your parents give you that? Were you born? Was it nurture nature? It's hard to have grit. Not everyone can follow through all the time. I'm sure I got a great deal of it from, from my mom and dad. and, 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 um, I think the rest of it I, I developed because I was I was hungry to 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 be in in the in the big time rock scene, you know. I was bubbling under with Black Sheep. We had two albums. We were on our way, and, and tragedy struck, you know. But 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 it wasn't it wasn't three months later that Mick called me, and I was in New York auditioning, and, and on our way to our first big album. 
Yeah, See, so Warner, it was very exciting times. You guys had like one great album after another great album, which, you know, and that's grit to me. That's the fact that I'm going, I'm not going to rest on my laurels. I'm, you know what? We got to work harder. I see a bigger vision. It's, you know, uh, um, in the back, we, we, we travel on a bus. We were doing bus tours. There was a big lounge in the middle of the bus. And then the bus driver was in the front. Then there was a small back lounge. And whether we were driving to a show from a show or, or it was two o'clock in the morning and we were leaving the show to go to the next city. Mick and I would be in the back room with a little uh, 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 four track. They had four track cassette players that you could overdub. So he would, he would play bass guitar, then rhythm guitar. I would sing the melody and we both sing the harmony and we'd have a drum machine. And we were, we were working on ideas for our next album. That is crazy. <laughs> you know, it's just an enjoyable uh, hang when you've got Lou Graham uh, on the screen and you're talking to him on on, on that level about this, the things that mean an awful lot to him. A few more tracks to go. I want to read some of your comments. Justin, thank you again for another Super Chat, do uh, super chat donation. Appreciate it. Um, uh, we're not sure what's going to happen with YouTube with us. We're going to continue putting out the videos and editing the videos we've got. But again, you know, people who have had a lot more subscribers than us, we have 130,000 are going, how come people aren't watching our videos? And these are way more successful YouTubers than me. So I don't know. Anyway, Justin, thank you. Uh, Graham is so 80s. One of the iconics of the 70s and 80s. Uh, uh, CBCV says, Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull once said that he was the best rock singer. Lou Graham is, he told me that when I interviewed, because I've interviewed, I think, Ian Anderson eight times, the last time being about a year ago. Justin, he said, this is just sticks, Commodores, someone getting shut out, choice or otherwise. Patrick Malone, hey, how you doing? Hey, Patrick, how's, thanks for coming on. Uh, the dude says Lou is a legend. Thank you. And I'm, I'm actually commenting via our other channel here. I didn't know I was commenting via Rock History Book. But there you go. Lou's voice is like Randy Meisner's, irreplaceable. Hey, thank you, Justiny. Uh, Steve says, I saw Foreigner right after Lou came back from having his brain tumor. Not to sound mean, but it was hard to watch Lou struggle to sing. It was very hard back then. Patrick says, Love Midnight Blue. Um, Justiny, super sticker, $3, Justiny. Thank you. He is, yeah, Justiny says he's better since then. He really is. He's improved an awful lot. More from Lou Graham. Uh, Jukebox Hero got stars in his eyes. I mean, there's so many, there's so many uh, great songs, that being one of them, about, you know, the, the dream of, of what, what could be, because every kid, whether they play an instrument or not, wants to be a rock star. There's that, that's part of everybody. Tell me about that one. I was in the basement of, of my first home that, that I bought, and I had a set of drums set up there, and I had a TEC four-track tape recorder, reel-to-reel -reel down there. And I started, I started with that beat, and, and the half, the half talking, half singing, standing in the rain, you know, and, and, and I don't know what I, what words I was singing, but I, I eventually honed it down to, to that. And, and, uh, and I got, got it to the point where it was take one guitar smash, you know, and, and at that point I, 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 I hit a, a creative brick wall. So, so I called Mick and I says, I think you're going to like this, Mick. Can I come over and play you something? You know, and he says, yeah. So we, I, I went over there and, and, and the way it started and the way I started singing and stuff, I was, I was watching him and I could see that, 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 that he felt what I was feeling, you know, and, and uh, by the time my idea hit a brick wall, he had his guitar in his hands and picked up where I left off. And when it, and 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 when it, we gotta keep it rocking, you know. And then and then we work together on that big chorus. 
That's and right. we, at, you know, even, even on a little cassette player or whatever, we, we put down the idea. We were jumping up and down or hugging each other. And, and we, we knew that whether it was accepted or loved or, or ignored as a song, that the song was, was we thought, of the highest level and, and had a message that every kid could identify with. Yeah. And it had a unique sound for Foreigner at that time. Very unique. Very Made you unique. stare at the speakers. One of those songs, when especially what you did in the beginning, I remember going, what? You know, like yeah, it makes you look. Doom, 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 right? Yeah. One of my heroes, Lou Graham of Foreigner. We have about three more clips, maybe more to play for. I think four more clips from our interview. In the last two, this is the third night now that we've done this. And we're actually going live in a little bit on our sister channel as well. Um I'll let you know about that in a second, but... Thank you for everyone who's come on. I want to read some of your comments. Uh, Justin E. wrote, Foreigner was the band that knocked the bedroom doors <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah, your girlfriend uh, was mentioning their songs. Um, Patrick says, doesn't seem to tell about the new stuff. He did talk about yesterday, he talked about Foreigner's, uh, Kelly of Foreigner, uh, Hanson, who's their, their current singer, he just said that he he felt uncomfortable being on stage with him. He did say he thought he was a good singer, but he was just fidgety and just jumping all over the place. I don't know what that that's about. Now, again, these are all Lou Graham's point of view. So we should remember that. I mean, when he's saying things about Mick Jones, I've not talked to Mick Jones. So I'm sure Mick would have his own version of the accounts uh, that he's talking about. So I'm going to make sure I know where I'm at. Uh, okay. More Lou Graham on rock history music. Uh, when you, when you were sitting there, Mick told you when you were auditioning or playing with them for the first time to also write while, and then sing what you wrote. Uh, uh, not really. No, he didn't say that. He, 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 he after, after I auditioned, I was singing songs that were already written. But like when I went there, I sang "Feels Like the First Time." That was completely written already, and I think uh, I think at War with the Worlds or something else. I think I did two or three songs that were complete already. However, when when he he knew he liked my voice and he he asked me if I would like to be part of the band, then he asked me. He says, "Do you write?" And I says, "I says I says, did you hear those Black Sheep albums?" And he says, "Yes." I says, "I wrote." a huge part of that that repertoire and he says fine he says we're going to start writing right away and the day that i was accepted in that evening i went over to mix house for dinner and after dinner we we worked on uh, um I'm trying to think what song it was long long way from home yeah for about six hours until one o'clock then i went back to my hotel room that is a great song i love that song <laughs> thank you um, the uh, I left. Uh, I left the small town Rochester for the Apple in Decay, and the Apple in Decay was New York because when I was down there, there was a garbage strike. The garbage hadn't been picked up in over three weeks. It was all piled up on the curb. The whole all of Manhattan stunk to high heaven, and that that I, I termed the Apple in Decay. That's a great line. And that song has a nice bounce to it too. I love, I love the way that you, you, you grab your words when you, when you're writing, do you ever sing it or? Uh, oh yeah, I have to sing it. Look who came in. Hey, hi. Shannon, Shannon was having a nap. Actually I was, I never nap. So it was really nice to be able to just have a little bit of quiet time. I just wanted to come and say hi. I miss being online with John, so I just want to say hi to everyone. I she, hope that you're having a nice long weekend. She was going to come on with me, and then she napped, and I went, she needs sleep, because sometimes we're up really, really early. We had a lot of errands to run this mm -hmm. morning. and uh, so. But Shannon promises she's going to be on more with me, right? Yes, I am, 100%. So we're going to, we're going to do three more, uh, three more. And Fraser J just said, you and Shannon are such a lovely couple. Oh, that's nice. Anyway, more... Uh, more from Lou Graham, uh, three more clips. Uh, in the beginning, I remember when I got into radio, uh, uh, 
I was pronouncing your name wrong. I mean, I know it's Lou Graham now because I mean you're one of the most famous singers out there. But um, have you had? Did you have people pronouncing your name wrong in the beginning? Because well, when I was in Black Sheep, I was still Grammatico, and they were pronouncing it Grammatico and Germatico, and they were butchering it. So when I got in Foreigner, just before we got our 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 our, our signing with Atlantic Records. Uh, uh, Bud Prager, Foreigner's manager, called me back in his office and, and he sat me down. And he says, he says, I don't think this is a problem, but I, I want to run it by you. He says, you've got a very ethnic and difficult to pronounce last name. He says, you're going to find out that when uh, uh, people who, who uh, are interviewing you or who introduce you, they're going to butcher your name. And you're gonna you're gonna bristle at that, and it's gonna start the interview off on a bad note. He he says he says if I were you and you could take this or leave it, he says I would shorten it to Graham G R A M. He said and, and and avoid all of that mispronunciation and getting off on the wrong foot and you having to correct them before the interview even starts. He says shorten it to Graham. And, and, and he says, and leave your last name the way it is for, for business purposes. He says, but for, 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 for performance and for the, the, the stage persona, he says, I would change it. So I didn't do G-R-A-M. I did G-R-A-M-M, which, which my full last name has two M's. How'd your parents react? They, they weren't thrilled about it. But when I told them the reason why they understood. Well, Mike Ranowski, Mike Reno. Right. Lou Graham about changing his name uh, for rock and roll purposes. I remember when I got into radio in 83, some of my friends were going, are you going to have a radio name? I said, well, when I used to practice in my bedroom, I used to call myself JB John, like John Bowden, JB, JB John. And all my friends hated that. They went, God, don't call yourself that. And then at that point, I decided not to. I've talked to a lot of people about them changing their names in rock and roll. We should do a, a full video of that. Oh, uh, 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 by the way, Diane Smith, thank you so much. Thanks for your super chat. Appreciate it. Uh, it means an awful lot to us. Usually, usually at the end of the month, you know, we, as a couple who make a living on YouTube, at the end of the month, we always look and say, okay, how are we doing here? How are the videos doing are we on par? And then maybe a week ago, we realized, wow, YouTube really has changed and our income has gone way down. And I've talked to a other YouTubers, a few who do what I do, who will remain nameless. And they said, my income's down too. And I think that's why some people are quitting YouTube. So thank you. <laughs> Your donations are appreciated. Uh, two more clips from, from uh, 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 Lou Graham. So Diane Smith, thank you. Patrick says, hi, Shannon. Very cute. <laughs> I'm sure she'll appreciate that. Fred C. Drummer. Hi, John. Finally got uh, uh, got to see you live. Thank you for coming on, Justin E. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, no. Don't put it that way. Don't say John needs cash. We're just, we're making, this month, for whatever reason on YouTube, they're shuffling things around because we had so many great interviews this month. Um, the inter The one I had yesterday, for instance, Originally with Lou Graham, that I think got a few hundred thousand hits. And I, we re-put it yesterday, repackaged it because a lot of people hadn't seen it. And it's sitting at 2,000 hits. And I'm going, what is going on with YouTube? That is crazy. We usually have at least once a month something that hits uh, uh, various 100,000 hits. And that hasn't happened to us for a while. We're going, something is going on. So um, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what's going to happen. Like I said, we got 30 interviews we got to get to. More from Lou Graham on Rocky Street Music. When, when you left home, for instance, I'm curious, on that stage when you left home, uh, what was in your record collection when you said to mom and dad, okay, I'm going, but what were you listening to at that point? Well, it was a cross-section of Beatles, uh, of, of w w what I liked out of, the pop, out of the popular era that we were living in. And I had a couple of jazz records too. <laughs> See, I'm not surprised by that because there's there's so much, there's like swing in your, and your phrasing's always been amazing. And the little nuances you put in, you know, uh, uh, some people call them ticks. I call them brilliance. Uh, 
did you get that from those guys or was that something that spontaneously came out of you? I, I think uh, it's a mix of sp spontaneity and, and what, what I uh, absorbed from, from those old singers, you know? Yeah. Uh, by the and, way. And, and the old rock singers like Bobby Rydell and Dion. I was a big, huge Dion fan. He's a great singer. Yeah. Oh, that's my cue to come on again. We talked about Bobby Rydell in one of the clips yesterday because I had interviewed Bobby Rydell where they called in, in Greece, they called the, the, the school Rydell High, which was a tip of the hat to Bobby Rydell because this movie was playing during his era, of course. And how I got familiar with Bobby Rydell again was wanting to see the songs that were big hits the year I was born in. Valari, his, his take on Valari came up and I went, Oh, Bobby Rydell. I remember Bobby Rydell. I'm going to contact him. And I found out. And I'm going, yeah, I thought he was still alive. He's no longer with us. But we had a really nice interview about him and the Beatles coming on the bus and and, and his first impressions of of, um, of the Beatles. It, it, it was really great. Thanks for all the folks who super, chat, super chatted us today. Uh, thank you. It's one of the reasons we have Patreon. I'm actually working on uh, Uriah Heap right now. Two members. Uh, for our Patreon account that we're going to start putting on tonight. Uh, it's kind of nice at night. I, I edit a lot at night. I don't know why. I seem to, I don't like watching myself and a lot of people don't. And somehow at night, it's a little easier. Our last clip from the great Lou Graham. When your parents, uh, you, you, coming from a musical family and you know, I've got a drummer. I was a drummer, but my son's a way better drummer than me, which is usually what happens. And I know your brother, played the drums after you and he was really, really good. Um, drumming's an interesting instrument. A lot of people start with it. I mean, I just talked to Bobby Rydell a little while before he died. Uh, he was a drummer first and Sinatra's a drummer. When did he, die? When did he pass? Um, Lou, I think maybe a month ago. I think about a month ago, maybe two I didn't months. even read about it. There was no headlines about it at all. No, here. no. And I mean, that's right in your yeah, wheelhouse. I, I liked him. Nice guy, you know, but but he's he had a similar story to you in the way that, and and you know you hate to sell tell somebody you should be dead, but Bobby had two tra transplants, uh, from in his case, uh, for him and and I read his book he he had a he had a major drinking problem in his and he's very transparent about it but but he he always says I should be dead and he said I'm lucky to be here I pray and you you were in a very situ similar situation ex drummer. Yes, and, and you like and you like the traditional guys too, right? I mean, from your family, you were listening to a big band and a lot of those artists. I was brought up on big band and Sinatra and Tony Bennett and Ella Fitzgerald and 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 uh, Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie, all all, all of those. And, and uh, I I grew to love them, you know. Lou Graham, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. It it took us a while. By the way, thank you. Um, Took us a while to get that interview. Anthony uh, Morocco, uh, thank you, Super Chat. He, Anthony says, was a producer at uh, WRIF 101 FM in uh, uh, in Detroit in the early 1987, and we were playing Midnight Blue in rotation daily. Great tune. What a what a beautiful song. And thank you for your Super Chat. Um, uh, whenever I tell Shannon, uh, she never asks if we get Super Chats because some channels... Uh, and I'm always happy for people who do well. Some channels, it's like crazy. You know, the the cutting edge channels, they go nuts with super chats. And I'm going, maybe that's just the genre. And that's cool. Um, we always applaud anyone who does well on YouTube. It's, it's, you know, it's hard making a living. But like I said, the last few nights, some nights, some months you do gangbusters. You have like three viral videos and you're going... Oh, good. We can we can breathe for a little a little while financially, and then other months you're going. We just put out our best stuff. What happened? And we know we're conscious of the things that are important. We watch those videos all the time. How to be more successful on YouTube? Uh, things like uh, you know your banner is very very important. That's why we put a lot of work on our banners. We put very little lettering on our banners, so it's easy to read them. We we try to bring bright colors on our banners. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the titles of the videos are going to be. We put a lot of time into this. Shannon and I will talk about it. We've got vidIQ, which sometimes helps us with, with uh, titles. Sometimes they don't help at all. 
the their suggestions don't help whatsoever. So and and then when we were starting our channel, I remember thinking YouTube just doesn't like me for whatever reason. I mean, I'm serious. I would get on there and I'd go, why? I've just spent like the the first total video we did on Aircom Radio Network, which was my first channel. Um, the first video I spent a month putting together the Toto 14 uh, album review slash biography. Luckily, almost everybody in the band and some people who weren't in the band anymore saw that video. And then I got connected to Toto and we started interviewing Toto. All the guys in Toto, we started getting a lot of feedback. We went, oh, we got a lot of Toto fans on here. This is not a Toto channel. So we knew we couldn't only do Toto. We had to do other things. So we branched out and that's kind of how it all started. But in the beginning, our hits were so low and I'm going, does YouTube just not like us? And then we flourished. We did incredibly well. Uh, we were sailing. And, you know, it's a it's a packed crowd of what we're doing. The other thing we didn't want to do is do too many controversial things. You know the YouTubers who do that. And I just felt bad about, if someone tells me something bad about somebody, um, I wouldn't say it's my duty to print it, but I also know that they're going to tell someone else the same thing. Right? Am I going to be the one to put, put out something salacious? It's a, it's a tough call for us. And we've done those kind of videos. But there are certain YouTubers who just do those videos. And I, I thought to myself, I can't sleep at night by doing that. that. That gets a lot of hits, those things. You know, the journey crowds and people talking about, you know, journey backstabbing themselves. I kind of jumped off the journey bandwagon because almost all the news was that kind of stuff. And I went, I, I don't want to do that. I, I, I like the journey guys. You know, for the most part, I like them. I, I was... When I was backstage at Toto here in Calgary, I saw um, their dressing room. You know, it was right beside Toto's. Toto's was over here on the left and, and Journey's was over here. And as we were waiting for Steve Lukather, Joseph Williams and, and uh, Shannon Forrest, uh, there was Dean uh, ready to go on stage to drum with, and he was like standing like right beside me, but he was so revved up. And I went, and my son Chase said, wait, that's Dean Castronova. Let's go talk to him. I said, you can't, man. He's ready to go on stage. You can't. That's a taboo. You don't go up to someone. He's in the zone. Let him be in the zone. But I'm looking at him going, he's a lot taller than I thought. But he's very thin when you see him in real life. But And I've never seen him, you know, because Steve Smith was their drummer when I saw them for the escape tour uh, way back when. But it was interesting because Chase wanted to talk to him because Chase is a drummer, my son, who's 20. Uh, but he doesn't know, you know, and maybe Dean would have been fine with it, but uh, Lou is so likable. This is from Fred. Uh, and Music Man. Hey, Music Man. This is a great interview. I seen Forner in 78 at the Outdoor Music Concert. Seen Lou with his solo band almost 17 years ago. Oh, wow. Justin E, LRB because of their story, which is sad. But geez, what can we do? We, we released an LRB video. That is another example. I released an LRB video as a lark because I was just not, you know, feeling 100%. Uh, mentally, I was just drained. And I and Shannon says, well, you haven't put out a video in a few days. So I said, I'll just put out this video. It's self-explanatory. I'm not going to introduce it because I talked to Graham Goebel of LRB. And basically, you can tell what we're talking about. So I'm not going to do an intro and extra and a big logo thing. We're not going to do that. She says, okay. So I put it up and it got, I think, six... 600, 700,000 hits. And it stopped at six or 7,000, 100,000 and 10. And I remember it just stopped and I'm going, wow, that was crazy. I just put that up. It was just an old video. A few months ago, I decided to repackage that same clip, name it something very similar, but not the same thing. So the clip was different because it was an intro and extra in it and it was produced and it was really nice. And, and it got, I think, 500 hits. And I'm going, I don't understand YouTube. I don't understand. <laughs> it's hard to make a living on YouTube. And don't get me wrong, we've had we've had some great months on YouTube where, where I'm going, hey man, we're, we're set. We are set doing this sort of thing. But YouTube is just kind of kooky. So there you go. We're not going to quit. We're not going to quit. But we're, we're certainly reevaluating. Because, um, uh, you know, I make a living on 
This is this is my job. I've been a ra- I've been a radio announcer for 41 years, but I'm retired. I recently retired this a month ago from radio. I was kind of like given my papers because the the company was got basically got rid of 4,800 people. And I knew that this time it probably would be me. Since I've been there for 30 years, I went, you know, that's fine. And they were really good to me. And that was even better. Uh, It's rare to be at a radio station for 30 years. It's technically 34 years because I was part-time for about three or four years, I think, or something like that. So it was a long time and I knew how lucky I was. So that radio job enabled me to basically do this. So there you go. That's my life story. <laughs> anyway, um, let me see. Doug Williams, tell Richie Fiore that uh, that a fellow, he was born in Ohio, said hello, pastor of a church in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, I'm not planning on talking to Richie Fiore. I've been asked to contribute to his documentary, and they've already sent me the questions, and I'm going to send them to them. Uh, I was very flattered that they asked me to, but but Richie Fiorini had, had, I think, three or four interviews with him, and they went incredibly well. So uh, I love talking to him. Anthony says, thanks, sir. Great show. Thank you for coming on. I might, uh, like I said, I might be coming on. Um, uh, Alan says, do more live stuff. I'm actually going to do more live stuff. Even though these last three nights of doing Lou Graham, Lou freaking Graham, all the all the uh, the the videos have gotten like two thousand hits. And don't get me wrong; it's not like we don't appreciate two thousand hits. We do, but we're also accustomed to getting in some videos with with an act of the caliber of Lou Graham. We're accustomed to getting in all usually a, a little under a million hits with all the videos combined. And for whatever we, YouTube's changing, we want to change with them. We want to learn more. We've gotten better equipment thanks to a lot of your contributions. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, have have helped us through uh, through the years, and it makes a difference. Um, like I bought this through your contributions. Like that's why this stream today was not a gong show like it was yesterday. Because I looked at it, I thought I got to learn this thing, so we got on. Anyway, I don't know how long have I been on. Fifty one minutes. There you go. And also, we're doing a lot of four K videos. That's another thing because YouTube doesn't say they want you to do that, but they want your videos to look like a TV show. A lot of folks, when you buy a new TV now, the first thing you see is Netflix. You know, on the TV itself, not even your cable provider, you'll get Netflix, uh, uh, um, Amazon, Prime, and you'll get all these things. And at the end, you usually see YouTube. A lot more folks are watching YouTube on their uh, TVs. So they want it really good quality. So the last few videos we've done have been really high quality because... We went, let's do it. Let's, I'm, I'm a professional broadcaster. I can do this. Might not have seemed that way on this broadcast, but I've done this for for uh, 41 years. So I can do that. Anyway, thanks folks. My daughter is having a bad night again. I can hear her. Um, she's screaming in the background and I got to go help out Shannon. It's her medication. She hasn't had a seizure in quite a long time. She's autistic, 25, but uh, she has bad nights. So... We will see how she's doing. Anyway, thanks for joining us. Thanks for all the super chats and donations. If you ever want to donate to the channel, we have a PayPal link in the description of the Rocky Street Music one. We'll put it on all the other ones as well. Join our newsletter. You'll get the videos. and At least we can help fix the problem of our subscribers not seeing our videos if you join our newsletter. That's in the description as well. It's just constant contact and and it's a safe uh, carrier and we'll do that. But thank you. Subscribe. Share our videos, like them, and all that fun stuff. Take good care of yourself this Easter long weekend. John Bowden, Rocky Stream Music.